Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. I'm Don Crafton in the Department of Film, Television, and Theater, and it's my uh, distinct pleasure to be asked and to, uh, uh, to introduce uh, Professor Yuri Sivian today. And um, before I forget it, I want to remind everyone that there is a sumptuous uh, banquet, or at least a couple of sandwiches, uh, after the talk immediately around the corner. So don't rush off on an empty stomach. So, Yuri Sivian is uh, someone I've known for a long time, and by a long time I mean back in the, the 1980s, I forget exactly when, it's probably just as well, um, and I'm going to embarrass him terribly here, but the, the first time I met Yuri was at the, the big silent film festival in Pordenone, Italy, and he and uh, two or three of his colleagues were over in a delegation to either present or plan, I forget, uh, the big retrospective of uh, early pre-revolutionary Russian films. And uh, I got to know Yuri there. And uh, everyone got to know Yuri and his colleagues because his uh, institution being what it was in the times when they were had, had sent them over with a total budget among them of something like $84. <laughs> <laughs> so we all got to know Yuri very well that week. <laughs> And, and happily so. And anyway, he's had a, a, a long and varied and fascinating career since then and has ended up as the William Colvin Professor. And he, has, he also has the, the longest title of any academic, and the, the length of the title matches the breadth of his interests, I think. The William Colvin Professor, Department of Art History, Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, Department of Comparative Literature, Department of Cinema and Media Studies and probably a couple of other things that have been added in the last week or two. He has his PhD from the Institute of Theater, Music, and Cinema from Leningrad in 1984. He studied film history in Riga and in Moscow, combining it with studying semiotics under the guidance of Yuri Lotman, a scholar many of you know by reputation, a prominent culture, cultural uh, uh, scholar and uh, linguist, too, and uh, Yuri collaborated with Lutman on a book on film language called Dialogues with the Screen, published in 1994. Sivian is the author of over 100 publications in 16 languages, including uh, a couple of really magnificent works, Lines of Resistance, Siga Vertov in the Twenties, Ivan the Terrible, Early Cinema in Russia and its Cultural Reception and his uh, magisterial Silent Witnesses, Russian Films, 1908 to 1919. Sivian is also credited with launching two new fields in the studies of film and culture, carpalistics and cinemetrics. Now, you've all heard of the, the plague of Asian carp and the Chicago River. Someone has to study this. Someone has to, to measure them, to count. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm told that's, that's another project. Uh, carpalistics is uh, actually the study of uh, different gestures in theater, the visual arts, literature, and film. Nothing to do with carp, apparently. Uh, Cinemetrics uses digital tools to explore the art of film editing. He's also involved in the restoration and video mastering of silent films. You can hear his voice on the audio essay for the DVD version of Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera and the audio visual essay on Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible, recorded on, Ivan, on Eisenstein, The Sound Years, the Criterion DVD collection. And his own CD, uh, Immaterial Bodies, Cultural Anatomy of Early Russian Films, for which you received the 2001 award for the best interactive learning project from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. He's also involved in the current r restoration of the uh, Charlie Chaplin of which is ongoing and has uh, reached the, uh, the the late teens and early twenties, and uh, he is co-teaching a course on that at Chicago now, and his lecture today on Chaplin Russian avant-garde laws of fortuity in art is based on that research. So we're very happy and fortunate to have Yuri Sivian here. Th th 
thank you, Don, for raising those expectations to which I have no chance to live up for you. Uh, and uh, uh, just to lower them a little, uh, let me add, uh, you didn't know, uh, but I'm not anymore in comparative literature. They kicked me out for inactivity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, and uh, thank you, uh, the Nanovich administration, for having me here and uh, placing me so comfortably. Uh, now, I don't think uh, you, you, and you, Don, are in the best position uh, since I'm screening my screen. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, it is maybe, may, may, may. Um, wind up more important than you expect. Uh, so, um, uh, the title first, and the, the title consists of two phrases, the second of which is not, not exactly mine. I borrowed this phrase from Viktor Shklovsky, Russian formalist scholar. Uh, we theorists need to know laws of fortuity in art. That's what Viktor Shklovsky wrote in 1926. Uh, now, Shklovsky's dictum was both programmatic and polemical at once. Uh, what it polemicized against were theories that saw art as a manifestation of outer laws, laws of human psyche, uh, with its suppressed drives and displaced desires, or societal laws that focused on the social thought or class struggle, or religious laws that encouraged the quest for the spiritual in art. Now, Shklovsky realized that Laws of fortuity is an internally contradictory phrase, uh, but he believed that this particular contradiction was intrinsic to art. In Shklovsky's view, law and fortuity were a kind of an output-input ends of the cognitive processor called art. Uh, Shklovsky, uh, uh, Shklovsky uh, never used, of course, uh, those modern terms, output, input, processor, uh, but he did believe that art was a processing device. What art as device processed was the raw material, uh, be it the experiential material we call a life or the semantic material of language. Why people needed art, Shklovsky theorized, was to experience that material anew, in raw, in fact. Uh, that experience involved seeing the lawfulness of the fortuitous and the fortuity of what we take for laws. Now, he called the latter, the fort what we take for laws, uh, the latter processing, seeing the fortuity of the lawful, uh, defamiliarization. Uh, as to the former, uh, the lawfulness of the Fortuitous. Um, the easiest example, the simplest example, is the rhyme, rhymes. It is entirely by chance that in a language like Russian, the plural for frost, that's what you experience outside, the plural for frost, morose, uh, rhymes with roses, rose. Uh, yet Russian poetry treats such fortuities as law. Now, a student of English verse might use womb and tomb as an example. Now, when Shklovsky called on theorists to study laws of fortuity, what he meant were laws indigenous to poetry and art. Now, another comment I want to start uh, with is about the first part of the phrase. Now, this talk is not so much about Chaplin as about what other people made of him, that is, about Chaplin's famous fame. One often hears what made Chaplin's fame really universal was that both highbrows and simple people liked him and liked him alike. Now, this view is sentimental and wrong. Chaplin was a man of two fames, as we sometimes observe a person casting two shadows, not necessarily simil similar to each other uh, or to the person that casts them. Fame number one was Chaplin's enormous success with regular filmgoers. Now, this fame came to him, came to him instantly in 1915, started in 1914. Uh, and more or less everyone by 1915 agreed as to who was the funniest film comedian in the world. 
Now, this was the kind of fame Chaplin could understand and knew how to deal with. The other fame, the fame I'll be dealing with today, emerged later between 1916 and 1919. This was when Chaplin became a cult figure among young European intellectuals, playwrights, poets, and artists. The fame, this fame, originated in France from when it spread to Germany and Russia, changing its shape and as it changed these countries. Chaplin was aware of this fame. Chaplin was aware of this fame. From time to time, someone would show him a strange picture of his Charlot, of his Charlie, uh, tell a weird story about him. And the more he learned, the more he felt puzzled. And once, he even asked Sergei Eisenstein for help. Now, let me quote a passage from a conversation between the two that took place in California in 1930. Eisenstein visited California then um, uh, and wrote an essay 15 years later, Charlie the Kid, and remembered this uh, conversation. So uh, he wrote this in 1945, uh, remembered a conversation with Chaplin of 1930. Charlie and I are in Hollywood and going to Santa Monica. As we are getting into the car, he pushes over a book to me. It is in German. Can you get a sense of what it is all about, he says? It is a German expressionist booklet, and at the end is a play dealing, of course, with a cosmic cataclysm. Charlie Chaplin pierces through the revived chaos with his stick and points to the way of escape beyond the world's end, politely touching his bowler head as he does so. I have to admit, I got stuck in interpreting this post-war delirium. Can you get a sense of what it is about? Is what he might have asked about much that is said about him. It is extraordinary how much metaphysical nonsense sticks to Charlie Chaplin. Now, I will return to Eisenstein's verdict in a moment. But first, let me ask what this German play about Chaplin could have been. Since all the book Chaplin had, uh, had in California are now lost, uh, all we can make our guesses. Now, let me make two. Uh, there are two German stage plays about Chaplin, which could pass for an expressionist drama, uh, each with some sort of cosmic cataclysm or another, though neither of them is exactly about the end of the world. One is a tragigrotesque drama, Chaplin, by Melchior, Melchior Fischer, published in Potsdam in 1924. Uh, in the last act of which Chaplin talks to, to a comet uh, that is threatening and approaching the Earth, and the comet becomes so confused that it cannot find the Earth anymore among the stars. And uh, uh, Now, the other candidate is the Di Chaplinade, the Chaplinate, um, 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 by mm, a better-known author, expressionist turned Dadaist turned surrealist Ivan Goll. Uh, it is a book drama, a play in verse, uh, a piece more suitable for reading than for performing. Gold's book became known uh, not only for its text, but also for its pictures. It came out with a series of illustrations by Fernand Leger. Uh, it was the first time that Leger tried his hand at Chaplin's figure, which would later become a recurrent motif in Leger's art. Now, there is no doomsday scene in the Chaplinian either, uh, but uh, there is one cosmic scale scene in which Chaplin is shown wandering in the desert and pulling a deer on a rope. Uh, a deer on a rope. He then sits down on a dune. Um, um, this is the passage uh, that uh, is highlighted there. You probably can't see it, but so I'm uh, just telling what, uh, what happens in the play. Um, uh, kisses the ground, Bedouin style, and begins to dig. Now, this is how Ivan Gold describes the rest of the stage direction. The earth opens fantastic views of the earth interior. On reaching its center, Chaplin puts a telephone receiver to his ears and listens at the center of a telephone system to the voice of the entire world, heard as if from a phonograph. Uh, uh, to illustrate this scene, 
Fernand Leger made this drawing. Now, this is Chaplin, depicted in the telephone exchange, located in the center of the earth. Now, a phone receiver is pressed to Chaplin's ear, and the writing around him represent fragments of phone talks in different languages. Ten million butterflies, elderly baker, baker murdered, un jour viendra, in the year 800, Charlemagne was, I love the lady from Zanzibar, Bittachon, la la la, petite femme, Charlotte, book six, brain bake, brains baked in butter, and so on. Uh, uh, by the way, Charlottenburg, a district in Berlin, uh, is an obvious pun on Chaplin's French name. Now, at one point, Ival Gold's Chaplin in the play loses his patience and explains, is that all anybody thinks of? A roaring at the center of the earth, tumult of lies, telephone stupidity, craziness of radiograms. What a poor thing is man. All literatures melt away at the golden world, word, pain, and so on. Now, sounds expressions to me, as may have sounded uh, to Eisenstein, if this indeed was the book which Chaplin had, had asked Eisenstein to interpret. But no matter whether it was this play that Eisenstein dismissed as metaphysical nonsense or another one, Chaplin could, ha uh, Chaplin could hardly expect an impartial answer. Back at home, Eisenstein belonged to a group which called itself LEF, the Left Front of Arts, an association of like-minded artists which combined futurist poets like Mayakovsky, constructivist artists like Rodchenko and Stepanova, Formalist scholars like Shklovsky and radical filmmakers like Zygavertov. These were different people with different views, but none of them, if asked, was likely to find for an expressionist version of Chaplin a better name than nonsense. But, on the other hand, plenty of nonsense about Chaplin was coming from the, their midst, dialectical nonsense, communist nonsense, and other irrelevant stuff, which I'll be trying to get a sense of in a minute. But before going to Russia, two pictures from Paris, where the Chaplin craze among intellectuals began. This is Fernand Leger, 1920, and this is Marc Chagall, 1929. Now let me use these two pictures to explain what I'll be looking at. Imagine them as two angles, of a comparative triangle, the third angle of which is Charlie Chaplin, whose both pictures claim to be portraying. I'm not going to compare the artist's manners. It takes an art historian to undertake this. What I'll be looking at are those two sides of the triangle which converge on Chaplin, not to discuss resemblances uh, and not to speculate how and why Chaplin's figure had been transformed, but rather to find, to find out about the give and take between the artists and their model. Hmm. Now, the dreamy Chaplin by Chagall, this is on your right, uh, who is losing his shoes and his face as he walks, and who carries his lost wing tucked under his arm, may look like a regular Chagall Schlimazel, but here is a question. Was it Chagall who gave the wings to, uh, the, the, this wing to the model, or did Chagall borrow this attribute from Chaplin? There were two films by that date in which Chaplin used wings. The Kid, in which Charlie is dreaming he's an angel, uh, and the gold rush in which he is turned into a chicken in the cannibalistic imagination of a starving prospector.
Uh, so where do, does uh, the Chagall wing uh, come from? Um, now, uh, while the wing under Chaplin's armpit looks rather angelic, now Chinese chicken feet, you see here the feet, uh, point to uh, the gold rush. But again, is the chicken image entirely Chaplin's or Chagall's, uh, or Chagall too had something to do with this? Now, this is not an easy thing to figure out. Uh, take a look at another picture by Chagall, the gouache, painted in 1928. Uh, uh, so, one year before he made, Chagall made his drawing of Chaplin, though after he would have seen Chaplin's Gold Rush. Uh, the title of this painting is La Poule, the chicken. Now, this chicken has a cap and a Jewish beard and is shown looking at the moon. Uh, uh, the reason why I'm showing this is not to say that this avian Jew derives or descends from the gold rush, no. Chaplin, Chagall, sorry, Chagall loved to paint, paint domestic animals and to cross them with humans. Now, the family tree must be more complex here. Chagall's drawing of Chaplin descends from Chagall's bearded chicken crossbred with the Chaplin chicken from the gold rush. So if you were able to follow this, uh, you'll agree that Chagall's chicken-legged chaplain is a freak of a second generation. Now, or take Leger, whose Charlot may at first look like just another of Leger cubist affairs, un objet mécanique, into which Leger used to turn anything his pen would touch. However, as we read what Leger wrote in a letter to his friend Blaise Sandrar, we come to realize that in this case, the impetus, as Leger describes it, the impetus came from Chaplin. For here it was, the perfect human puppet, man the machine, exactly the kind of synthetic which he, Leger, had been looking for. So much was this artist captivated by Chaplin that he even made an attempt to animate this drawing and turn it into a film called Charlot, Cubi Charlot Cubiste. Now, pieces of it were included in Leger's um, later film, Ballet uh, Mécanique. Now, I now shift the scene to Soviet Russia, where early on, Leger's idea were known and welcome. And so was his puppet-like chaplain. Early in 1922, some of Leger's Charlot drawings were reproduced in three Russian language constructivist publications, in the art journal Object, in the film journal Kino Fot, and uh, in the book by, on new art by Ilya Renburg entitled, And Yet the World Goes Round. Uh, as a result, even before Chaplin's films reached Russia, Soviet Russia, uh, the French worship of Chaplin was already there, taken up and adjusted to the tone and the terms then in use among the Soviet left. You almost visually experience this shift when you open Ehrenburg's book on Leger's page, on Leger's, Leger's page size Charlot drawing and read on the opposite page what Ehrenburg has to say about Chaplin. Charlot is one of us. He's new. He's left wing. He's a futurist. Charlot does not rely on inspiration. He is not an intuitive comedian, but a meticulous constructor whose movements are based on schemata as rigorous as those of a medieval juggler. Charlot's movements are funny, not because they are spontaneous, but owing to the precise formula he is using. And note that the words uh, that the words uh, futurist, note that the words futurist, constructor, and formula appear in larger fonts here. Uh, these were the catchwords of the left wing studio talk, and such was the constructivist practice of making catchwords jump off the page. I begin my account on Chaplin in Russia with another three angled comparison, this time between A a poem by Vladimir Mayakovsky, B, some pictures by Varvara Stepanova, and C, a mysterious movie to which both the poem and the pictures seem to be pointing. Mayakovsky's poem, written in 1923, named Film Crazy, is about Chaplin and old, fat Europe. 
and how this little tramp that now merely tickles Europe pink will soon lead the tramps of the world against her. It's a revolutionary thing. Now, uh, this poetic prophecy ends in an imaginary gesture. The poet reaches for a movie theater program to look up the next picture in the bill. Meanwhile, projectionist, show us more movies. Usher, hello. The latest attraction, this one is his newest. Charlot the Flyer, Airborne Charlot. Now, let me ask the same question as, uh, as, as, uh, as I did when speaking of Charlie the Chicken by Chagall. Charlie the Flyer, is it merely a poetic image or perhaps a reference to a Chaplin movie? The answer is not as simple as the question may suggest. Those who know Chaplin will say it's an image, for aside from the angel dream in the kid, no flying stunts are found in Chaplin's silent films and no planes. Uh, and those who know Mayakovsky will agree, adding that it's a stock image, for there are other airborne characters in Mayakovsky's poems between 1922 and 1925, and these were the take-off years of Soviet civil animation. Aviation, aviation. Sorry, Don. Uh, now, one of Mayakovsky's books of poetry was even entitled The Flying Proletarian in Russian. Letayushchi proletari. So it's poetic etymology. Uh, now, all this is perfectly true. And yet, evidence exists that the airborne Charlot may not be, after all, an entirely Mayakovsky's invention. I will now show some pictures and then a clip from a movie and I'll connect the picture with the movie in an attempt to explain how it happened that the image of Chaplin and the idea of flying became apocryphally connected. And this connection uh, may have or must have occurred entirely by chance. Uh, all the better for us uh, if it has, uh, for we can use it, this example, to study the law of fortuity in art. Now, uh, the pictures I'm going to look at are by constructivist artist Varvara Stepanova. Uh, they uh, come from a series of drawings which she uh, did for the special Chaplin issue um, of the constructivist magazine Kino Fort, uh, which came out in September 1922. Now, this is Stepanova, and the man whose bold head she is proudly tapping is her husband Rodchenko, also a constructivist artist. Now, hanging on the wall behind them are the covers of the Kino Fort, which Stepanova designed, that's her work, including her cover for the Chaplin issue, inside which more of her Chaplin drawings are found. Now, here are two of them, uh, two of these. Now, people familiar with, with the constructivist doctrine will easily tell why these little figures were called constructions, not depictions. They have texture, they are not enslaved to the page, and they do not represent Chaplin's mannerism, but reenact them. And on the whole, they are akin to other geometrical figures, humans, uh, which Rochenko and Sipanova used to draw and paint in the very beginning of the 20s. But again, my task, my task here is not to discuss Stepanova's art, but to ask about her stake in Chaplin. There are nine pictures all in all, and three of them show Chaplin as we have never seen him in his films. Now, uh, 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 here we see him grasping at a propeller, which is spinning as indicated by the two arrows and the hat blown off from Chaplin's head. Uh, now, the text, uh, Russian text reads, Man on a Propeller. It is the film's title, and the whole thing looks like a sketch for the film poster. Uh, now, here is another page uh, with two more pictures with, which gives us an idea of how he got there how Chaplin got on the propeller. Uh, uh, the one uh, at the bottom, sorry? Is that the one? Yeah, the, the one at the bottom of the two. The one at the bottom, um, okay, sorry. Oh, uh, okay. The one at the bottom shows Chaplin trying to jumpstart an aircraft. 
using the method called, and this is old pilot English, English uh, to spin the prop. Uh, while a frightened lady is shown waving her umbrella. Now evidently, he succeeds, but fails to, to jump aside. Uh, for as the plane takes off, Chaplin becomes part of the propeller. Mm, note uh, the fan-like shapes that indicate uh, uh, yeah, note the fan-like shapes, note the fan-like shapes that indicate that he's spinning. Note also the blades, the blades of this fan are shown in foreshortening, which indicates that uh, this living propeller is flying uh, straight into us. There are two questions I want to address. The first one, factual, is about the film. The other one, hypothetical, about the interest it could have held for Stepanova and constructive in the constructivist circle. About the film, two things are clear. It is not by Chaplin, and it is not something out of Stepanova's head. The film existed, was shown in Moscow, and was reviewed by the theater weekly, The Spectator, by a critic who was not particularly impressed. I quote this uh, critical essay. Uh, Chaplin makes one expect a good movie, but Man on a Propeller dis deceives our expectations. Uh, the movie is shoddy. It claims to be about wonders of technology, but the eye of the camera mercilessly reveals them as crude props. Chaplin is brilliant, but his partners are mere extras. Their attempts to be funny pale next to the topmost acting technique shown by this genuinely eccentric, a former acrobat and juggler. The theme of the script is espionage, the subject characteristic of the bourgeois society. Characters' adventures, aside from arise from desperate attempts on the part of secret agencies of two rival countries to procure the secrets of aviation technology. I unquote. This is the whole review. Now, so what is this movie? I first thought it was made by one uh, of Chaplin's much-hated imitators. Uh, there even was a Russian emigre among their number, Arkady Boitlo. Uh, who used to make films in Germany that openly challenged his famous original, Beutler against Chaplin. This is, uh, uh, the, 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 this, is this film that advertised here. Uh, it, and this is what is written at the bottom of this picture. Uh, but after having spent some time pestering slapstick experts, thanks to one of them, and this was Jennifer Bean, I finally have the title and also a general idea of how it became associated with Chaplin. It must have been the 1916 Keystone comedy Dizzy, Height, Dizzy Heights and Daring Hearts, which sees Chester Conklin as a foreign spy eager to outdo a representative of a rival power in the acquisitions of airplanes from the U United States. Um, this is the first clip which shows Conklin throwing out uh, the lady with the umbrella. And this is an aerial chase. This is uh, the rescuer, but she's already uh, going down. So, uh, yes, uh, um, the, she is the airplane manufacturer's uh, daughter. Uh, uh, nevertheless, even if she escapes, our spy spots her and kidnaps her again. And this is Charlie, uh, sorry, this is Chester Conklin, uh, Chaplin's partner, not imitator, and the moustache is different. This is the walrus type of moustache, not Chaplin's toothbrush. So everyone had something for Chaplin. This is the moment of truth. Uh, so, uh, this Conklin film was, as we know now, advertised and reviewed in Russia as Chaplin's. Now, what must have happened is this. Chaplin's name was a rage, 
but his films were pricey. Besides, in 1922, not many people in Russia knew real Chaplin's face too well, since it was only that year that the new economic policy reopened the country's markets for foreign films. So it is not hard to imagine some light-fingered importer going through the distribution documents, rubbing out the conch part of Conklin's name and replacing it by Chap. Apparently, by the end of the summer, the secret was out. Uh, for this is what we read in the editorial of To the Kino Fought Chaplin Issue, uh, signed by its editor-in-chief, Alexei Gunn. This is what he writes. Uh, Chaplin's name is so big nowadays that it makes shady profiteers rub their hands. Tens of so-called Chaplin films shown recently on the territory of Soviet Russia, like The Death of a Monster or Man on a Propeller, are Chaplin's film without Chaplin. It is in order to put an end to this profiteering that we decided this special issue of Kinofot uh, to, to dedicate it to, Chap to Charlie Chaplin, this first and unique film comedian, let all our comrades know, and so on. So I will uh, later return to this angry editorial. Now, we read this on page one, but no sooner kicked out of the door uh, that the this pseudo chaplain comes back through the window. Only a few pages later, down in the issue, we see the stubborn little movie again looking at us from these drawings by Stepanova, who, as you will agree, had improved about the original. Not only does she give her hero the benefit of a frontal view, she also shows her Charlot triumphantly soaring, whereas in the film, the propeller adventure ended in disgrace. Now, uh, is, uh, so now is the time to ask that second question. What could have been so special about Men on a Propeller that made Stepanova make this film her own? I know this is a speculative question, but I think I can answer uh, uh, it without letting speculation take us too high. First, Stepano was a constructivist artist, and it was much in the nature and in the program of constructivist art to imagine the man of the future as man the machine. Here are two preparatory drawing studies for Stepanova's Chaplin series, and we can almost see her brush doggedly trying to capture the moment of truth, the moment when the man turns physically into a mechanism. Here, he still looks like a man, and there, he's already a propeller. Secondly, constructivists loved planes and used to point up and yes, sorry, uh, yes, and uh, this is of course uh, also of course a faithful depiction of uh, uh, Chester Conkling spinning. Now, uh, uh, the second question, uh, the second the second hypothesis, uh, secondly, constructivists loved planes and used to point to light uncovered structures of early biplanes as the best inspiration for the perfect artwork. Now, these two photographs come from Edinburgh's constructivist manifesto, and yet the world goes round. I showed some of it earlier. Uh, he reproduced them to illustrate this point from his constructivist program. Our task is to build an art object that would be able to fly. Now, such are two rather obvious points about constructivism uh, one can make to explain uh, the case of Stepanova's man on a propeller. There is also a third one, more roundabout and less obvious. Uh, to make it, I must return to the question of authenticity so indignantly raised by the editor of Kinofot and so lightly dismissed by Varvara Stefanova if indeed she knew that what she believed was Chaplin was in fact a different man. Maybe she didn't know. Maybe the whole incident happened by an oversight. Uh, but then that's the end of the story. And to quote that famous intertitle from Murnau's The Last Laugh, I like this strange story so much that I think it deserves a more interesting ending. Now, so let us assume, for interest's sake, that someone, well, let's say Alexei Gunn, the editor of the Kinofot, who's Philippic against dishonest film distributors I quoted a moment ago, that he looks at the drawings and says, at Stepanova's drawings, and says, 
hey, did you know that this film is not by Chaplin? And that Stepanova answers, who cares? Now, is there a context we can find that could be used to justify such a position? Now, the quickest way of finding this out is to take a closer look at the text inside uh, the, the issue embedded uh, with Stepanova's drawings, or rather, in which, among which Stepanova's drawings are embedded. Uh, first, there is that, mm, first, there is that angry editorial. Then, there are three constructivist essays, each developed, each, each devoted to Chaplin. One by Stepanova's husband, Alexi Alexander Rodchenko, another by Lev Kuleshov, then in charge of a workshop of acting students whom Lev Kuleshov trained according to what he declared was a new scientific method. And another one by theater director Nikolai Foreger, then head of Futures Theater named Foreger Workshop, workshop uh, whose most talked about production, The Dance of Machines, came out exactly in 1922. So three big names three fashionable left-wingers left of 1922. Um, take another look at Gunn's editorial. Even though Kinofort was a constructivist magazine and Gunn saw himself as a constructivist theorist, there is little specifically constructivist in saying that Chaplin is inimitable, that people who paid to see Chaplin are entitled to see his genuine films. This is common sense. Any journalist would say this. But as we move on to those other essays, the mental picture of Chaplin that we discover grows increasingly different from Gunn's, and a far cry from anything we know about real Chaplin. Their Chaplin is a left-wing intellectual, a theorist, even a scientist, and a dedicated teacher. And I must stress that this image is not fanciful but conjectural. For the less these people knew about Chaplin, the more they modeled him upon themselves. As was typical for the Soviet avant-garde groups, constructivism is a movement, as a movement, was born from theoretical debates held at an educational institution. Here, it was taken for granted that artistic culture is transmittable and teachable, that ideas are as important as artworks, that new forms in art come always as a trend, that the purpose of art was not entertainment, but instruction, and so on. And let me repeat, even though real Chaplin would hardly buy into any of this nonsense, it is to this nonsense that we owe the constructivist image of Chaplin. You can tell, by the way, it is typeset, uh, that this passage comes from Rodchenko's essay. Its text is not, is not printed, it's designed and looks like a mathematical equation. What it says is, Charlie Chaplin is master of detail, master for masses, Lenin slash communism, and Edison slash technique. Now, this trinity, Chaplin, Lenin, and Edison, makes more sense than may at first appear. According to Rodchenko, these three men held three different keys for the better society, for the better tomorrow. Edison knew about electricity, Lenin knew how to build a better society, and Chaplin uh, knows the secret of perfect physique. Why do we need him? I quote from Rodchenko. Uh, and Rodchenko's answer is this, to teach us, half a billion of us, how to do ordinary things form, ordinary gesture, the art of walking, how to wave our hand, how to put on a hat. For, misled as we are by the conception of bourgeois beauty, we neglect the true beauty of everyday movements and gestures and the clear lines. This is Rachenka. Now, uh, this strange idea that Chaplin, with his offbeat walk and his idiosyncratic gestures, is in reality an expert in the new kind of plasticity to which the future belongs, and which Chaplin teaches people in the enormous classroom of all film theater in the world. Crazy as it may sound, this idea was not of Rodchenko's own invention. Rather, this is a recurrent fancy in the Soviet mythology about Chaplin. I think I'm able to pinpoint its place of birth, which of all places was Belgium and show how this fancy got to Russia. 
where it became part of constructivist mentality. But before doing this, a few words about Foregers and Kuleshov's essay about uh, Chaplin from the same mm, special issue. Now, Foregers' es for essay is about Chaplin idolizers and Chaplin imitators. And it is from reading Foreger that we can easily imagine why Varvara Stepanov may have taken it lightly had she been told that her little propeller man was not Chaplin but someone else. Its title is Charlottenburger and Chaplinism. Now, the word Charlottenburger is a triple pun uh, on Charlie's French name, on the name of a district in Berlin, Charlottenburg, and importantly, on the word Burger, Burger, which in German and Russian means the same thing as uh, the English and French Petit Bourgeois. Now, these Charlottenburgers are idolizers, the portly European middle-class moviegoers for whom Chaplin is merely en vogue. It is for them that the yellow press concocts incredible anecdotes and stories from Chaplin's life. All these cheesy consumers want to know about Chaplin is what Chaplin eats and with whom Chaplin sleeps. Now, the second term in the title of Foreger's edit, Chaplinism, refers to Chaplin's imitator. Now, these imitators, Foreger explains, are Chaplin's followers and students. Charlottenburger may snub and slight them, but we, the Soviets, must realize that Chaplin is not alone. He has created an army of chaplains. Nowadays, Chaplinism is a school. To illustrate this point, to illustrate this point, Foreger quotes a story he came across in the Paris Le Soir. According to this newspaper, one theater proprietor announced a tournament of Chaplin's doubles. Unknown to the judges, Chaplin applied but was not admitted. Evidently, this was a canard, a morality tale about the true genius crowded out by his epigons, or something as trite. Whatever the original message of this story the, uh, was, there is no doubt that Foreger got it correctly, but much in the spirit of the Soviet 20s, decided to turn the tables. Why did Chaplin imitators succeed in surpassing their teachers, Foreger asks. Clearly, he answers, because they studied him on the screen. So they have had two teachers. One was Chaplin himself, and the other, the, the cinema itself. Chaplin, and I quote again the end, the finale of Foreger's essay, Chaplin is an academic. He invents new technique, creates the canon, and launches a school. From there, the school takes over. Chaplin provides new formula, which the school develops and popularizes. American film comedy exists under the badge of Chaplinism. Unquote. Apparently, in Foreger's eye, Hollywood was not what it was an internally competitive community, still is, but a collaborative research institution, a huge workshop of sorts. If we assume that Stepanova shared this illusion, there is no wonder she did not care who was the man on the propeller, Chaplin himself, or a disciple from uh, whom Chaplin had trained. Now, we don't really know if Stepanova believed in the Chaplin workshop myth, but we do know that Kuleshov did. We know this from the essay uh, in the Kinofot, special issue on Chaplin. And we know this from a letter, from a letter which Kuleshov wrote and addressed to Chaplin. Not many people have Chaplin's mastery of their bodies, the essay says. This is because Chaplin had studied the mechanism of his bodies and treated it as a mechanism. The only other actors that treat their bodies the way, this way, is a group of young people from the experimental workshop at the State Institute of Cinema, which I, Lev Kuleshov, happened to teach. We study human bodies on the basis of exact calculations and scientific experiments. And Charlie Chaplin is our first teacher, period. Unbelievable as it may sound, Kuleshov meant what he said. In 1924, he made an attempt to contact Chaplin by mail on behalf of his acting workshop, Experimentalny Kina Collective, as it was called. This is not an open letter or a Dear, Chaplin, Ch Dear Charlie letter uh, of kind Chaplin got from his fans, uh, but a letter a scientist might have written to a colleague abroad, a methodical affair with sections numbered in Roman and subsection in Arabic. Uh, 
One, who we are. Two, what we have achieved. Three, what we want from you. And two more points, elaborating on the theoretical principle. And of course, it begins with, dear sir, Milostivy Gosudar. As to their own bibliography, uh, the main item on it was 1922 article entitled The Kino Institute, in which the principles of Kuleshov's workshops are laid out by Alexei Gan, the same guy, and illustrated by one of the workshop students, Piotr Galadjev. From this essay, Chaplin would learn that during the experiments, students were instructed to think of themselves as mechanisms, not humans. And indeed, uh, in the etude called Destiny, bottom right, student Chachlova and student Pudovkin look like two robots involved in a family quarrel. Uh, that for every ordinary gesture, there is one and only one right way of performing it. And see student Komarov demonstrating in an etude called The Phone Talk, bottom uh, left bottom left, the right way to lift the receiver and put it to your ear, that to train your body to perform actual movements, actual movements, which is what student Chloe is shown doing on the picture uh, on the, at upper right. A special mechanism, mechanical contraption, contraption uh, was used, uh, made of a plank, a rope, and a pole. So uh, imagine Chaplin's face if he indeed received this letter by mail. Mm. Why was Kuleshov so convinced Chaplin was as much in love with science as he himself was? One source uh, uh, of it was a Belgian literary rumor. To get to it, I need to explain something about Kuleshov's workshops. The ideas, method, and the equipment they used were not exactly their own. Many of them Kuleshov borrowed from the work done at another research institution, namely the State Institute of Labor, built to adapt to Soviet uh, conditions the labor efficiency methods developed by the American Frederick Winslow uh, uh, Taylor. Now, the Labor Institute was uh, geared to study human locomotion, and this was something Kuleshov's workshop used too. This is one of uh, Soviet tailorist labs. A guinea pig worker operating a hammer uh, is being photographed by a chronophotographer to obtain a graph of his movements to be uh, later printed on uh, uh, one of those um, mm, um, printed, uh, and printed, printed, and schematized in one of those diagrams called uh, cyclograms. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, the result uh, was the results were analyzed. The results were analyzed, tested and published to improve the technique of hammering and such like operations. But keep in mind the Soviet Taylorism aimed higher than merely the raising of labor efficiency at Soviet factories. Its ultimate, its ultimate goal was uh, the forging of what Trotsky had named the new social biological being. Taylorism was seen as the Soviet answer to eugenics, a theory of human race improvement by means of selection, which was at that time popular in the West. So there was a clear bridge uh, between uh, the Soviet left theater and this institution. Both imagined themselves scientific. Now, uh, but what on earth does this, mm, uh, all, all this have to do with Chaplin? More than an outside observer might suspect. Now, take a look at the essay, The Taylorist Gesture, by one Ippolit Sokolov, a self-proclaimed art theorist who did not belong to the core of left-wing theater movement, but rather to its lunatic fridge, fringe. Now, this Sokolov used to take up the ideas implicit in the work of people like Kuleshov and Meyerhold and drive them uh, to their logical extreme. Now, this essay is a case in point. 
as the Taylorist Institute of Labor trains workers to move rationally as they, at their working places, it says, so must the theater teach ordinary people move correctly in ordinary life. Illogical, indecisive, curved and rounded gestures must be banned from the future socialist state. The straight line plus the acute angle will be the staple of the new style which Sokolov calls Quote, the style of Russian Socialist Federation, unquote. Now, uh, it is in order to transmit this new style from the stage to the streets that Taylorist tools must be used in actors' training, Sokolov goes on. Uh, like this grid covering the walls and the floor in exercise room. And we know, indeed, Kuleshov's workshop, acting, acting workshop, used these grids to train the actors to feel uh, free and precise in the space of the stage. Um, um, uh, his essay also makes a, an obscure reference to a mysterious foreign professor, Lo Charloshi, ostensibly known for his methods of teaching everyday movements by making his pupils imitate operations performed by machines constructed uh, for this special purpose. Now, this foreign professor, Lo Charloshi, uh, was not of Sokolov's invention. Lo Charloshi is the literary character invented in 1920 by Belgian author Franz Callens for his novel Melusine, whose imagery Literary, whose imagery literary historians of our day have labeled pre-surrealist. Uh, in its chapter entitled Our Teachers, Machines, Helens makes the reader enter a vast corridor of sorts with various mechanisms aligned across its walls while people grouped in front of them are trying to imitate the motions of their mechanical parts. We also encounter the inventor of this method, Professor Lo Charloshi, whose profound philosophy and faultless mastery of his body contrasts with his funny looks and enormous boots. It took no trouble for critics to craft the professor's name and find out who is hiding inside. Charlo. Okay. Uh, uh, this is how Helen's funny wizard explains what he does. I have studied people. The mistake people make is that they do not understand what the true movement is. Nature is a good teacher, but nature is erratic and prone to whims. Only mechanisms can discipline nature. Gods are dead. Our teachers are our own, own creation, the machines. Franz Helen's novel was never translated into Russian, uh, nor was it into English, as far as I know. No. Russian readers learned about Professor La Charlachie via Helen's essay, Literature and Cinema, published in 1922 in the constructivist magazine Object Vesch, uh, Gegenstand. Uh, as this essay explains, the superhuman precisions and control that distinguish Chaplin's films, especially The Kid, inspire the same kind of respect for their maker as one feels towards the builders of aircrafts and cars. The reason for this is that, quote, no artwork of our days comes close to the blinding clarity of this film's internal mechanism, says Helens, the Belgian. Now, in uh, my recent novel, Melusine, Helen adds, I turn Chaplin into a scientist, a weird and wonderful genius of dynamics, whose movement schools installed in four parts of Europe, herald the new ethos of social movement, and so on. Can imagine the kind of resonance a talk like this must have caused in the poor mind of a young proselyte like Sokolov. But, of course, as we know, some stronger minds, uh, too, did not remain unaffected. Now, time has come, yes, time has come to round up my story about the relationship between Chaplin and the Soviets. Uh, what I think makes this relationship interesting and worth looking at is that it is not just between Chaplin and whoever takes a pen and writes about Chaplin or takes a pencil and draws his picture. There's always a triangle, a third force that interferes. Leninism, Taylorism, 
Thomas Edison or Chester Conklin, something utterly irrelevant which makes this relationship uh, relations similar to a keystone comedy, a comedy of mistakes or a comedy of mystifications. Now, this brings me back to the, phase, to the phrase, to the phrase I used for the title of this essay, law, The Laws of Fortuity in Art. As I mentioned, uh, it comes from a book written in 1926 by Viktor Shklovsky, and as I said earlier on, Shklovsky used this phrase polemically. It was pointed against the old school scholars, mostly interested in regularities and laws, religious laws, political laws, societal laws, and the laws of sublime, which they believed manifested themselves in works of art. The scholar of formalist school, Shklovsky had little patience for such like, such like laws. The only laws the student of art and literature must be mindful of are the laws of fortuity, he said. For if there is one thing artists know better than anything, it is how to make use of chance and how to make sense of nonsense. Now, if we go back, if we look back at the story I told about Chaplin and his Russian avant-garde shadows, uh, we should admit that Shklovsky had a point. Take the connection. Uh, uh, yeah, mm, uh, take the connection we discussed earlier on between Chaplin's chicken and that chicken painted by Chagall. Each of the two chickens belong to a separate, autonomous world. Chaplin's chicken stems from the world of British stage buffoonery aided by Hollywood special effects. In his turn, Chagall's chicken belongs to the Paris school in painting coupled with the Russian Jewish thematic material. A Jewish chicken looking at a Russian church is a complex cultural image. Chaplin's chicken, however brilliant, is a slapstick gag. Chagall's chicken was born in the head of a French painter. Chaplin's chicken, chicken in the head of a famished poultry lover. Not even a die-hard cultural theorist will venture to say there is more than coincidence in the encounter we witness here. Today, we realize that this, of course, uh, uh, was but a chance encounter. But can we be sure that Marc Chagall realized this as well? Apparently, he did not. For when in 1923, after several years of absence, Chagall returned from Russia to Paris, this is what he said in his very first interview in the magazine L'Art Vivant. I quote, Europe has changed. I was glad to discover that expressionism has triumphed in Germany. I'm excited about the birth of surrealism in France and about the presence of Chaplin on the screen. Today, Chaplin is perhaps the only artist with whom I could find a common language." Unquote. Now, uh, making law of fortuity, <coughs> making, I'm finishing, making law of the fortuity, uh, we have seen, uh, was something that Leger did when he invented his Chaplin the Cubist um, and even animated this figure in Ballet Mechanique. Ivan Gol too, who in tandem with Leger detached Charlot from his home medium in his film poem, the Chaplinade, the Chaplinade, turned Chaplin into a cosmopolitan globetrotter, a figure similar to the one Gol made of himself when he wrote, this is what Gol, the author, the poet, wrote of himself. Uh, in the same year, 1920, Ivan Gol has no home. By fate, a Jew, born by chance a Frenchman, made by the whim of a rubber stamp, a German. Here's my epilogue, and epilogues can afford being a little irresponsible. Uh, let me therefore finish this talk with an irres irresponsible hypothesis. The point I began this talk with was that Chaplin had problems understanding what European intellectuals made of him. I quoted Eisenstein, remember Eisenstein's essay, Charlie the Kip Kid, in which the Soviet director recalls how he tried and failed to explain uh, to Chaplin uh, that German play, uh, that which I believe was this, the Chaplinada by Gaul.
In Chaplin's eyes, we assumed this was all pure fortuity and nonsense. Uh, we never asked if he ever tried to convert this impressionist uh, nonsense into a law. Now, imagine a different, an opposite, an alternative scenario. Allow for a moment that Eisenstein did give Chaplin a brief idea of some main thing about Gold's Chapliniad. Chaplin's globalism, globalism, is the main leitmotif of this poem. Chagall's, sorry, <laughs> Chaplin's uh, fame is global. This is one thing. Chaplin is the citizen of the globe. He trots the globe and he spits, splits the globe asunder to listen uh, to its womb, to in its womb, to multilingual telephone conversation. Forget about this. So the globe is on uh, the leitmotif. So in Act One, I'm referring now to Gaul's Chaplinet. In Act One of this play, the moment Chaplin climbs off the, his poster and becomes human, the globe image emerges for the first time, and Gaul's Chaplin is in ecstasy. His face becomes radiant, and he says to himself in verse, in German, this is the text, to be human is enough to make us great. The world turns softly, the world turns softly, and you are balancing the globe on your finger and will toss it back to eternity, infinity, sorry. Now, suppose Eisenstein translates this verse to Chaplin and the car, and Chaplin, in turn, translates Gold's metaphor into the language of mime. Would it sound too good to be true to suggest that 10 years later, Gold's poetic fantasy of a globe turning and bouncing on Chaplin's finger resulted in the pantomime that Chaplin's Hitler performs in The Great Dictator after saying to himself softly, out Caesar alt nullus, I'm emperor. If so, Chaplin's journey across media, poetry, film, and pictures uh, ends in homecoming with a trophy. And I want to end this talk with the fragment of uh, Chaplin playing Hitler in The Great Dictator. Emperor of the world. here too.
time just for a, a one or two questions for the sumptuous beast begins. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, just very briefly, just uh, from your irresponsible uh, epilogue, which I found wonderful. Um, the great dictator also early, early in the film, we do have the airplane stuff. That we don't have yeah, it here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should don't have it. It's flying yeah. up, yeah. Uh, up, upside down. Yeah, that, that's another thing. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be interesting to include that in the in these fortuitous. Yeah, things. and uh, uh, this was probably the only um, uh, airborne stunt that Chaplin uh, ever made. He was really, really afraid of planes. And of course, this is not a real plane. Neither was a uh, Keystone plane a real plane. But these are high and Model. It was uh, a full scale model, but it's a miracle. Thank you very much.